today, Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. So far the word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, peace, and hope to all who trust in the Savior Jesus. Amen. In the Lutheran service book, both divine service setting one and setting two begin with this reminder from 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In divine service setting three, the call to confession is taken from Hebrews chapter 10. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. It is then followed up by, one of the, ver by the verse, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, which denotes the majesty of the Holy God, which is then in turn followed up by one of the verses of today's psalm. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Divine service setting four starts with a similar reminder. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, but is then followed by, if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Lastly, Divine Service 5 opens in the same manner as Service Setting 3, which we just did. Now the daily services of Matins, Vespers, Morning and Evening Prayer do not have confession and absolution, although the service of Compline does. Similarly, the prayer, service of prayer and preaching does not include confession and absolution. The service of corporate confession and absolution opens with the words, I will go to the altar of my God, to God my exceeding joy, while the service of individual confession and absolution opens with the recitation of one of the seven penitential psalms. You're sitting there thinking, okay, pastor, that's great. But what are you getting at? Or in fine Lutheran tradition, what does this mean? Well, I share this to show that as Lutherans, we generally open our worship services with this practice of confession and absolution, understanding that we who are unholy are now entering into the presence of the Holy God. And we do so mindful of the fact we don't deserve to be here but by the gracious invitation of God. Scholars understand that both Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 were written in regard to David's sin of adultery with Bathsheba and with the murder of her husband Uriah as recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Israel was at war, but King David decided to set this one out. One night, he walked along the terrace of his castle the palace looking over his capital city and he watched a beautiful woman taking a bath. It was Bathsheba, the wife of one of his faithful soldiers, Uriah. David summoned her to the palace, bedded her in his chambers, and she soon found herself pregnant with his child. To cover up his sin and to try to protect his as of yet untarnished reputation, David had Uriah ordered back to Jerusalem in the hopes that he would go home and sleep with his wife and that they could somehow pawn off Bathsheba's baby as being his rather than the king's. Well, that plan didn't go as laid out. That's because conscientious Uriah, being a conscientious soldier that he was, was unwilling to enjoy the comforts of being home when his fellow warriors were still out in the field encamped around the city they were laying siege to. And so David ordered him back to the front. In fact, to the very front of the line where he was killed in battle. And then the king magnanimously cares for Uriah's grieving widow by bringing her into his palace as yet another one of his wives. 
Now, you know, all kinds of rumors had to be going around. Too many people knew what had really happened. Jerusalem was buzz with speculation. And the prophet Nathan was alerted by God to go deal with David. And so Nathan comes to court and he puts David on the spot in a most dramatic and public fashion. David's secret sin becomes front headline news in the Jerusalem Gazette. Now what fascinates me at this point is that when David is both confronted and exposed by God's word, seems to me that he almost breathes out a sigh of relief. David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Found out and paraded around in his royal court, David readily admits his sin, which God also readily forgives. But what an emotional turmoil that the king endured during this time of trying to hide his evil deeds. Listen to his words of lament, beginning at verse 3 and following. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now David bookends this penitential psalm with a reflection of and a rejoicing for God's heart of mercy and grace. Writing, first of all, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity whose spirit there is no deceit. And then he goes on to close with these words. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, O you upright in heart. Where David had transgressed, that is, rebelled, God chose to graciously forgive. Where he had sinned, God chose to cover that sin with his own righteousness. Where the king's iniquity burdened his conscience with guilt and shame, God elected to wipe the slate clean. As Solomon, David's son and later heir, writes, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Hence, David now tells the people what he learned throughout this painful experience. He says, Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to God at a time when he may be found. And then he goes on to say, You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. David confessed his sin, and he encourages everyone else to do so because Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. And so, we practice confession and absolution as Lutherans, not to assuage our guilt or soothe our shame, but to receive the comfort and the peace of forgiveness that God grants us in his grace. Luther in his small catechism teaches that confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution. That is, forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. Again, we hear David describe the impact of God's forgiveness when he says, But when I kept silent, bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. But then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We come before a holy God as an unholy people. But with our confession of sins and our plea for mercy in Christ Jesus, we hear God's pronouncement of forgiveness. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, 
not the Son, not the Holy Spirit. We recall Peter's admonition to Jerusalem. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. As Ted Cober writes in his book, Confession and Forgiveness, quote, Ambassadors of reconciliation profess our faith in Christ as we confess our sins and forgive the sins of others in Christ. And the reverse is also true. Our witness to Christ suffers miserably when we justify ourselves or refuse to forgive others who sin against us. We take comfort in our confessing of sins knowing that God in Jesus takes them away as far as the east is from the west. Truly, we understand that blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. And while we could stop right here, right now, and walk out those doors, being glad in the Lord, rejoice, O righteous, shout for joy, all you upright in heart, I would be remiss if I didn't point out God's grace doesn't stop here with us. We have been forgiven to be forgiving. Now while there is evil out in the world that needs to be opposed with the truth of God's word, our goal is not to be running around condemning and bringing people to God's wrath, but to bring them to the realization of God's grace being there for them. You know, our society has become so fixated on shaming people on social media, canceling those who refuse to bow the knee to their false narratives. Hurting people just don't need any more pain. They need to be pointed to Jesus. I invite you to turn your Bible to the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Turn to chapter 5. Find verse 16. That's where I'm going to begin. Listen to what the apostle writes. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, just as David shared with the people the anguish of trying to keep his sin hidden and the relief and the release that came out of his confession of sins and God's absolution, we who have been forgiven by God in Jesus are called upon to forgive others in Jesus' name wherever and whenever possible. Remembering that many are the sorrows of the wicked, but that steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. May we who have been blessed by Jesus strive to be a blessing to others in his name. And so go out and be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart, because Jesus makes it so. And all God's people said, Amen. If you would.